Hello, everybody. This is Tom Sega from Duluth Pack, and this is the Duluth Pack podcast, Leader of the Pack. And today we really have a leader. We have Dot Sheehan from Operation Hattrick, and we're going to get into that in a little while. But before we do and before we introduce Dot, we're going to talk about some awards and recognitions. You got to listen to this. So everyone put on their, their hearing right now. Dot, uh, from the, the University of New Hampshire, won the Alumni Association Profile of Service Award. She is the first female and University of New Hampshire staff member to win the Innovators Award. She has the International Collegiate Licensing Association, that's a mouthful, 2020 Hall of Fame inductee. She became the 10th recipient of the prestigious Collegiate Licensing Association's coveted ICLA Service Award. With that, welcome Dot Sheehan. Hi, hi, Tom. Thank you for having me on. Holy cow! I'll tell you what. I, as we were talking before we got started, I'm all intimidated now for somebody who's winning all these awards and recognitions. This is pretty impressive, but we're going to learn about it. Yeah. Well, again, you know what? It's not all about me. It's about this work we're doing. So, and I've had a long career, many careers, <laughs> many careers at this point. You've done a great job. So what, what we want to start with, Dot, is we want to learn all about you. So tell us where you're from, where you went to school, what you majored in, just so we have a starting point to start asking some great questions. Okay. I am originally out of New York City, and my father was transferred to New Hampshire. My mother thought she died, right? She did not even have a driver's license at the time. That's how long ago it was. So and my father traveled. So it was not easy for her. My mother came from a very Italian background. And it's like she said, I came to New Hampshire and there was no good delicatessen. There was no good pizza. And there was no good bakery. Well, what, what was I going to do with that, right? So I think she missed it for many, many years and uh, spent a lot of years in New Hampshire. I'm still in New Hampshire. I went to the University of New Hampshire and started major in French and decided that wasn't for me. And I minored in French and majored in English. So I guess that always helps. You know, if you can speak and you can write, you've got half the battle won. If you have a personality, despite all the technology today. Well, and, and you know what, uh, I, I think you and I are from about the same vintage and, and uh, uh, you know what, back then we didn't just have all that technology. I mean, I always say I graduated college without ever being on a computer and people are like, what? And, yeah. uh, you know, we actually had to, and, and when you were uh, majoring in English, I'm assuming you had to write a lot by hand. Well, that's right. We had to actually talk to people face to face. Oh, crazy. Well, you know, and we're doing this over Zoom, which I, I'm i not overly comfortable with. I'm becoming more comfortable. And, and uh, but boy, face to face sure matters, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. It's got to be a component. You can't give it up. The virtual has helped a whole lot, especially during the pandemic. So I'm glad we have Zoom things. I mean, it, it certainly has helped everybody. But yeah. And for those who think they don't have to talk to people, you know, I have a grandson who is 14. He's in California. During the pandemic, he said, if I never went back to school again, I'd be OK. I'm like, what? And so that's not healthy either, you know, to be oh. virtual all the time. Um, he's you know, they're not virtual anymore. And he's so he's glad he's a freshman in high school. But yeah, it's like, really? Yeah, let's talk to people. And, and in business as well. And, and uh, you can tell us a lot about that in, in, in your whole history in business, because, you know, uh, looking at your resume, it looks like you started as the first female agent in sports. Can you tell us all about that and how you got from being an English major to a sports agent? Yeah, I worked in another college and my son uh, in New Hampshire and my son went to a basketball camp and Robert Parrish of the Celtics was uh, was his camp. <clears throat> and he was with his friend Clifford Ray, who played for the Golden State Warriors, and they happened to be best friends. And my son wasn't overnight camper, so he'd come to see me every day. And I'd like hide in the bushes and watch him because he was pretty uh, reticent about going to camp. Um, and Robert and Cliff decided, who is this woman and what is she all about? So they'd come and sit in my office. I'm like, wow, OK. 
And then there was a company in New Hampshire uh, that did T-shirts and they wanted somebody to endorse their T-shirt line. And they asked me to put the deal together. <clears throat> and I said, wow, holy cow. So a lot of people look for the uh, personality to represent. And I had the personality to represent. Then I had to develop the business, right? So it was a real learning experience to work with professional athletes. Uh, I never um, negotiated their playing contract. I would do their marketing contract. So it would be TV, sneaker contracts, um, appearances, that sort of thing. So somebody else did their money and they always had an attorney who did their, uh, their contract. So I was on the marketing side of their lives. And again, it was a real education about, and that was before, Facebook or any of this technology that knew every single move they were making. But still at the time, it was, you know what? I could have been out of business in a day if I was seen in the wrong place. And they certainly could have had their reputations ruined because of some of the things they were doing. And it was like, wow, wow, they're doing what? They did what? <laughs> so, so for you, it was also like herding cats, right? <laughs> Just trying to keep everyone in line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you think you're brought up at all, normally there is a lot outside that normalcy that uh, I didn't really know existed, but learned pretty quick, quite frankly. <laughs> so, so in that, so you jump in head over heels into sports marketing, uh, agents for employees, and 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 representing them in their their deals with whether, like you said, sneakers or clothing or all that, and and uh, that had to be in the beginning, the infancy stage of a lot of this these advertising contracts. Tell us how some of that. How do you start something? How do you even do that? Well, and you know what? I was in New Hampshire, and I have a mentor who played for the Celtics for 14 years. He was a player coach. He was the first black bass. He was the first black coach at Harvard, and uh, then spent 20 years in the NBA itself doing player programs. He said, "Sheehan." He either called me Sheehan or Hoss. I'm like, I'm a woman. What are you calling me? Yeah, I have a first name, but that's okay. He said, "Sheehan, <laughs> you need to be seen because nothing happens in New Hampshire." Number two, watch where you're seen because you could be out of business tomorrow. And he was 100% right, 100% right about everything he cautioned me about. So very quickly, I learned that, whoa, yeah, what he said is probably right. I should probably listen to what he said. <laughs> really interesting. <laughs> so you take this good advice and, and how did you take that advice and parlay that into working with? And then we'd like to, if you can, ask you some of the, the players that you worked yeah. with. You mentioned a couple. Yeah. 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 So uh, it was Halloween and I'll never forget it. And I went to a Celtics practice uh, to see Robert Parrish and a couple of other guys. And Rick Fox was new in the league and he was assigned to the, the Celtics and um so I was, I asked for an introduction and Parrish said he would give me an introduction. And then he introduced me as an ax murderess. <laughs> and I, I just hope that Rick would have a sense of humor, right? I'm like, oh man, yeah. And Rick is, was, you know, his mother uh, is Canadian. His mother was born in Canada. His father's from the Bahamas. So Rick appealed to many different populations. So Canadians, North Carolina, where I went to high school, Bahama, it's because he's from the Bahamas, and Boston because he played for the Boston Celtics. He and he had this smile that was an absolute killer, killer. So you knew he was going to be a heartthrob in Boston. I do know that Larry Bird took him under his wing, and uh, Larry taught him all the things about what he should and should not do, like in Portland, Oregon. See those women outside the bus? You're going to see them in L.A., you're going to see them in Utah. You're going to see them in Dallas. They're after you, right? And that was uh, advice well taken by Rick. When, Rick. when Eric Montross came into the league, it was really funny. I wanted to represent um, Eric and I had told, his father was an attorney in Indiana. Now there's a kid who went to school in Indiana, but decided to go to school in North Carolina. He got death threats because he did not go to Indiana. Crazy. I'll tell you, people take their sports pretty serious, don't they? Oh man. So, right. So, I mean, I talked to his father and I said that Eric would go number nine and he'd go to Boston. Oh, his father was not happy. He thought he'd go much higher. He would not go to Boston. Guess what? He was number nine and he went to Boston. See, we need to take parents out of the equation and just let 
people have fun and, and do their thing. And, uh, and, and, and instead of the parents thinking he should have gone number three or four or five instead of number nine, I'm sure he, he did just fine. Well, well, yeah, it was interesting because uh, then I wanted to represent him. And I got a call one day and somebody said, it's Jack Nicholas from Golden Bear Management. I'm like, what, what are you talking about is Jack Nicholas? Well, he was very friendly with Eric's father. And so he and Dean Smith and his father decided that Golden Bear would represent Rick, uh, Eric and not me. So if I developed something, I'd have to give 50% of my fee to them. Okay. I was like, oh, I worked so hard for this. And, and I don't know how much of that had to do with they didn't know me. I was a woman all that way back when, right? Uh, well, within a year's time, his father's a very intelligent man. He could see that 100% of what had been uh, negotiated for him, except for what was automatically in place, I had developed. So he said, okay, that deal's off. You represent Eric and you'll get 100% of what you develop. So it worked out in the end. Eric was traded about five times. Now there's a young man or a Rick Fox. You would wish your daughters would marry them because they are such fine young men and they were great to work with. Let's face it. I was not going to get a Michael Jordan, although I worked with some pretty high profile players, but you know, there were certain levels and it's interesting. I don't know if it was Sherman Douglas or who it was. Might've been D Brown who said at the time, somebody said, how do you feel about a woman? representing you. And they say, I have no problem at all. As a matter of fact, I'd rather have a woman. I was raised by a woman. I trust women. I have no problem with that at all. It's interesting from the player's perspective that it was not a problem at all. Let's talk about that. You hit a word there, uh, that the word trust. And obviously as an agent who's negotiating uh, contracts for them, for, for advertisers and, and, uh, and, and, a person who's at the top of their game, they're a professional athlete, they're one in a million, and yep. they're young and impressionable. You hit on that trust thing. Tell me how you build that trust with people who could be, I mean, they're at the top of their game. There, there could be some arrogance here. There could be that, that you know, I want the, the biggest, greatest, best of everything just handed to me, even though they work hard at their trade and their craft. How, do you, how did you go about building that trust with people who are such superstars? Well, it's interesting because if you had, <laughs> I was new in the, at the game, right? There weren't very many, if any, women doing what I was doing. So it was like, yeah, I mean, how do you? You show up, you put a deal or two together, you show that they get paid, they get paid on time. The deal is a good deal and nothing iffy about the deal and they begin to trust. And then a parish had no... Um, reticence about introducing me to a Rick Fox. And then if you're around enough, guys get to see you. And that's always, am I around enough? So New England, yeah, I'd have to be in New England, or maybe I was somewhere where I was in another market or somebody recommended me to another market. Uh, and, and that worked pretty well. But yeah, trust is something that is really interesting. And it takes a while, it takes a while to develop that trust. Well, in any in anything you do. I, I couldn't agree more. One of the statements that I've always had is trust is earned slowly, but it can be lost very quickly. I used to say to my kids when they were teenagers, your the trust is there now. It can be over like that tomorrow. And you start over if you do ABC or XYZ. So you've you've earned a lot of trust with, with these players. Can you can you tell us some of the brands that you represented with them? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I got a call one day from Champion. They wanted um, Vladi Divac of the Lakers wore a black size 17 sneaker. Now that, and to in, invest in that is a lot. They wanted somebody on the East Coast that wore a black size 17 sneaker, right? Parish fit that bill. Uh, and I think ultimately somebody put that deal together and not me, but that, that's what they were looking for. So they called me again and said for the Super Bowl and Dallas was in it at the time. That'll tell you how long ago it was. There was a player that they wanted to put under contract um, and they said, this is what we'd pay him. But tell him not to tell anybody in the locker room because it's more than we're paying anybody else. Right. So you call the guy. The guy doesn't know me and talk about trust. He said, don't F me, baby, baby. I want to get paid. Okay, got it. Yeah, you'll get paid. And I say, and don't tell anybody in the locker room. The next day, somebody called me and said, did you see the LA Times today? Uh, no, what? 
that size 17 black shoe was that big on the front page of the LA Times. Of course, he told everybody in the locker room. <laughs> so, so how do you how do you handle that then? I mean, you, you you wanted to keep this quiet, and now it's out in the public. How do you handle the the backlash from that? Luckily, it was then and not now, because there was very little backlash, and if there was backlash in the locker room, he had to deal with it. Okay, so it didn't yeah. come it didn't come rolling down onto you to to help cover that. No, no, it really didn't. No. And luckily, I was not high profile enough to, well, we're not going to worry about her, right? It's the Super Bowl. It's a one-time deal. It's not not that big a deal. Today, every little thing is a big deal. So, yeah, I'm glad it was then. Well, we have we have social media and everything else that, uh, you know what, if it happened five minutes ago, everybody already knew about it 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, Which, that's true. That's true. Oh, it's crazy. So let's talk now about you pivot from being a sports marketing consultant to senior associate athletics director for internal relations at UNH for many years. Yeah, I was external relations. So I did anything that affected the external public. So, I mean, there were a couple of of, of instances where I'd make X amount of dollars. And then one of my clients had had a drug charge. The six-figure deal on my desk, null and void, because that's in the contract, right? So now I, I was going to make that, and now I lost it. And I'm trying to educate two kids in college. So you quickly say, okay, I need to do something else here, because you can see that pattern. How much am I going to make? And then how much am I going to lose? How much do I get at the end of the day? And so the university had built a facility, a hockey facility, right? You'll love that. And um, that, yeah, that hockey facility had skyboxes and there was nobody to sell them. So it was either this firm in Houston or they could get an alum who knew the state well, who was really going after local people to buy in, right? I mean, there were a couple of corporate uh, entities, but they were local or regional. And uh, so I was hired to do that. And then a position opened up internally and I happened to love the student athletes. I loved watching the games. I loved everything about it. It was great. And part of my job was to develop programs or opportunities that made athletics and or the university look good. And so that's Operation Hattrick, and we'll get into that. Sure. So so 20 years in that position at UNH. Can you tell us some of the the transition that you went through? Um, I'm assuming you went through Title IX and uh, all of that in your tenure there. Uh, the changes from when you first got into the external relations role to 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 be you know when you first started to when you left that position. What are some of the changes? Because they had to be dramatic. Yeah, you know, on the scholarship side, luckily there was a senior um, women's administrator or senior administrators who oversaw all of that Title IX stuff. So um, luckily we weren't in the name image likeness game at that point. So we didn't have to worry about athletes getting paid for something. And that certainly would have been uh, that senior associate athletic director who would have handled that. I was, you know, like handling tickets or... um, Uh, customer service or events or kids at tailgating and their ability to behave or not (laughs) at homecoming, right? You know, some of that then impacted the university. So yeah, you saw a lot of changes. You saw a lot of changes on the scholarship side. You saw a lot of changes about, it was an arms race in terms of facilities. People were building and building. Now, the University of New Hampshire is Division One, of course, in men's and women's in everything across the board. But football, football, they're at a one equivalent of a one double A level. So it would be James Madison, North Dakota State, those kinds of schools. But so even the University of New Hampshire had the worst press box in America. Hands down, absolutely the worst press box in America. The last eight years, maybe there's a new facility, very uh, utilitarian, very much like New Hampshire, beautiful. That that, uh, press box is gone, Um, but you saw other schools. And so it became more difficult to recruit because kids know. And kids know whether you have a Nike uh, swoosh on your shirt or not. (coughs) What is anybody wearing on the sideline? 
So in terms of facilities, it was difficult. And then you're a school like the University of New Hampshire that is a land grant institution that really, really believes in a good education. And who were we accepting and who weren't we, right? We hardly made any uh, concessions for somebody who was not qualified to get in. And so, um, and there wasn't a wink and a nod about we'll take him and don't tell anybody. That did not happen at UNH. Uh, very tight ship. And those kids really, they had unbelievable grade point averages and have gone on to uh, terrific careers. And then how many <coughs> scholarships uh, can the university afford? to give and how many sports do you have? We went through a couple of iterations of eliminating sports and that was so terribly painful for everybody. It was difficult. What, what, and I wanna go back to a little bit about, because I know there has to be some fundraising of some type, um, but you said you lost some sports. Let's talk about that and then we'll go back to fundraising to get your new press box or, or how did you sell the arena? But let's talk about some sports that were eliminated that you mentioned. Yeah, baseball. Now, if you take baseball in New England, particularly this part of New England, uh, I think Maine still has a baseball team, but they there was no in indoor facility. So practice time was tough. I mean, it could snow till April. The season was difficult. They didn't have the budget to go to Florida to train. They didn't have a couple of full-time coaches, and that happened in a couple of sports. Uh, we had crew. We had tennis. Uh, and those we had wrestling and those were sports. We had men's lacrosse. Then you had to be careful about Titan Line, right? Men and women had to match up. But those are the kinds of sports. So I think UNH might have 19 sports now. They had 29 at one time. And that's way too much for a school the size of UNH. What is this? What is the size of the school there? What well, was think, it when you were there? Yeah, well, and I think it still holds true. I think they probably full time students uh, no more than 16,000. And then they have, you know, they have um, maybe masters or they have um, online courses or things like that. But it's a small state institution where I was is the main campus in Durham, New Hampshire, and um, probably one of the nicest campuses out there. It is really beautiful. So when a sport's going to be eliminated from a university, you know, you have kids under scholarship and, and you know, they might be, let's say we have a junior and all of a sudden the decision has been made. How do you, how do you do that? I mean, is it just, just, we, we chop the program and, and we're very sorry. Uh, how does that go about? They honored those scholarships. Okay. Yep. The kids, yep. the kids didn't play anymore. Their athletic, their sport, but they honored the scholarship. That's right. Correct. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty noble to, to be yeah, able to honor yeah. that. And, you know, you made them a promise and um, that was difficult but uh, they, they honored scholarships. So you couldn't do too many sports at once, although, you know, might've been four at once, which was difficult. And I think now they've got the bare minimum that they need to be in sync with Title IX and they're not adding sports. I don't think there's any discussion about adding sports. I haven't been there for a while, so, but I would imagine there's, there isn't. Yeah, it's very expensive. Yeah. So let's let's talk about now um, fundraising or or selling uh, name naming rights. I, I don't know if that was happening when you were there, but you, you talked about uh, you now needed to sell some suites and you needed to sell uh, uh, season tickets for the hockey. Let's talk about that first mm -hmm. and then we'll go into the football with the the uh, press box. Yeah, well, uh, hockey. Uh, you know, at first it was the staff that would, we had a position that would raise money for facilities. And then out of the development office, there became an athletic development department. Uh, and now there's a company, Learfield, that handles all the third party rights. So they do the sponsorships. Uh, in terms of hockey and season tickets, you know, there for a while, we went to the Frozen Four many times in a row, never did win it. Um, but um, yeah, it wasn't difficult to sell season tickets. I even created an area in the wit, a hundred seats. You had to pay, they, they paid a premium to sit there. You got a little something to eat before the game and all of that. And somebody said, watch out when you put that up online, it's going to sell out. I mean, like that, it did. Now you have to remain competitive. UNH has had a couple of down years. And so I'm not sure how difficult it is to sell season tickets. I think it's been more difficult, but in the heyday, Oh man, that's the place you wanted to be. 
Kind of like our UMD Bulldogs right now. It's uh, it's sellout. It's three-time yep. national champions, and it does great things for for a program. Exactly. So we get that. So let's talk about the press box at the football stadium. Um, how did you go about getting funding or selling rights, or how did that go about? To you said it was horrible, but this needs to be improved, or we're not going to have a great program to yeah. to right. to uphold. And it never got improved until there was a new facility. I mean, it got, <laughs> we were number one in the country, right? ESPN was coming to do a game. Oh, dear Lord. When they looked at the power needs, we didn't have them. So they bought a, brought a generator and a backup to the backup because we could have had the town in a blackout. Drawing all the town's power for ESPN. Now, my son, uh, I don't know where he was at the time, California or maybe Washington. He said on TV, it looked great. I said, those are low camera angles. So you don't <laughs> see what's going on. At the time, that press box was not enclosed. I mean, they said it was. It was not. It didn't have windows. It didn't have lights. Barely could get your computer up and running, right? Like, okay, if it snows because the... Playoff is in November. Now, what do you do? Oh, man, we had, oh, man. People would come like, you want me to do what? You want me to go where? You want me to sit where? Uh, it was fun for a while. And then, you know, it gets to be, uh, they didn't want to do a game from UNH because we didn't have the facility. They had to because we were number one. If you were one through four, you got a TV game somewhere along the line. Now with the new facility, they love coming to UNH because it's just great. But there was a lot of fundraising. The athletic director, Marty Scarano, did a great job. Uh, they got a video board in it. It was a lot of angst to get that. Uh, and Sean McDonald's been there a long time, 20 years or more. He was a player there. He was a student there. And Sean worked his tail off to get that program to a level where it deserved what it has today. And it does deserve it. That's awesome. And, uh, it, you know, those years that they were top five and, and all these people had to come, they probably came kicking and screaming, but you know what? Tough. You have to come anyway. Exactly right. Oh, man. Yeah. Now looking back on it, some of that was funny, but at the time it might not have been so funny. I'm assuming it was rather stressful at the time. And, and uh, Oh, man. I think it was James Madison who came up and said, did you guys even mow the grass? And we said, because we had a grass field, right? We didn't have a turf field at the time. We said, no, we did that just for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the one thing yeah, you get. Right. Long we get, grass, we get so you can't play. Right. Yeah. yeah, so you get to trip over your yeah. own feet. After 20 years in that role, you pivot again, and you go into nonprofit. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about your thought pattern when you start all of this. And, and Operation Hattrick? Well, I'm getting older, first of all, right? And you can see the writing on the wall that I'm not, a lot of this is self-imposed, but work six and seven days a week. I went to every game imaginable. I mean, what did I really know about lacrosse? Not a whole lot, but you know, you want to support those kids. I oversaw volleyball. So um, really interested in those. I was always interested in them as players. I had a daughter who ran track. Track got next to nothing and no scholarships. They did get scholarship, but very few at UNH. And my daughter was a sprinter. And I used to say to her, for crying out loud, you're in the 55. It, uh, it takes like a minute. Can you please? I just drive three hours to watch you. Can you please do? So she said, okay, I'll do that. And I'll do the four by one relay. Okay. So it's the beginning of the day and the end of the day. I'm still <laughs> there forever. For sure. oh. Yeah. Uh, and her now husband was a football player. And in track, he was the captain of the throwers. So he threw the hammer and so got to know a lot about track that I never really knew. So I wanted to support the kids. So I was working way too much and could see that, uh, you know what, maybe I don't want to do that forever. Still loved every minute of it, but heard a Boston radio broadcast one day, a trivia contest. What is the one thing? head wounded soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan want the most? The answer was a baseball cap. It covers wounds and swelling and treatment and bandages. I was so taken by it. Like, can you just get them a hat? I mean, really? I mean, really, is that that difficult? 
So in the middle of the night, I thought, well, if we did something, luckily I have that personality, right? Somebody said, aren't you glad you were listening to the radio station? I said, aren't you glad that I'm the person I am? Because I did something. Did anybody else who was listening to that? And this is a very popular radio station. And so I thought, okay, we'll call it Operation Hattrick. Not realizing at the time as it grew that it screamed hockey, right? I mean, it does scream hockey or soccer. Mm -hmm. So, and is that all it was? So um, at first it was retailers would buy three hats. They'd only sell two. They'd give the third back to me and we'd give it to VA medical centers for guys with head wounds. And that was, you know what you needed? You needed a headwear provider. We finally found it in 47 brand out of Massachusetts, our own bookstore. And then UNH was the first school. Okay. So we'd have, and then, you know, a couple of years in, we were doing that and I was doing it a little part-time and I wanted to grow it because I could see when I leave UNH, I would love to do this. When you can see the help and the difference you make uh, that I wanted to do this. So I thought, okay, how are we going to do this? And somebody from the University of Notre Dame said, you need to take it national. Not a clue how I was going to do that. Not a clue. You know, registered it as a nonprofit. And uh, the athletics gave me some release time to work on it, which was great. Certainly made the university and athletics look good. We had two Navy SEALs who had been killed. One is the son of a professor and his wife. And so we dedicated Operation Hattrick to Nate Hardy and Mike Koch. Mike is from the uh, Penn State area and Nate is from Durham, New Hampshire. And so we said, okay, uh, if we've got that, so how do we take it national? And we had to have those three things in place. And somebody said, maybe Dot, in six months, you'll have 50 schools sign up. In two months, we had a hundred, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Holy okay. cow. Now, adopt it means a lot of things. Through our licensing agency, who does all of our work on a complimentary basis and we're forever thankful. Um, they make sure they take care of royalties. We developed a business model that nobody had out there and they still don't. It's completely different as a nonprofit. We make money through selling product and merchandise. Nobody mm -hmm. else does that. They rely on individual contributions. They may have a one special deal and they do that everything we do. So if you're selling a 47 brand hat with the University of Minnesota Duluth Bulldog on it and it's at wholesale, $12, we get 10% of that. So we get $1.20. If mm -hmm. it's just Operation Hattrick without UMD on it, we get 12% or $1.44. Every school stays whole. So Florida may have a royalty rate of 18%. We add 10, now you're at 28%. So it gets tough now to make money, right? Uh, but no schools would have signed up. Well, and it, the prices never went up to accommodate. If they did, they went up 50 cents. So they have never imposed that because it's Operation Hattrick. Uh, so that's how we would make money. People still give us money. But the bulk of what we do is on the merchandise and product side. So we needed licensees. So we had 47, went to a Notre Dame game, went to their bookstore, which is like an experience. So I looked at that and we had a hat on the hat wall. At the time, Manti Teo was a senior and they were undefeated and we were right next to him. But who knew, knew it was Operation Hattrick? So in the bookstore, there are two little cubbies and they have merchandise for the South Bend, Indiana Fire Department and breast cancer awareness. They make $100,000 a year for the South Bend, Indiana a Fire Department because they sell a lot of merchandise. So the licensing director at Notre Dame said, you need more than hats. You need apparel. You need to now segment that, make it its own thing. And it stands out at retail. Okay, so that's how we got into apparel. Uh, and, um, you know, we have 16 licensees now. We have over 500 schools. We've got about 14 NHL teams and 12 NBA teams, not in the NFL or uh, Major League Baseball because they do things differently. So in the NHL, Boston Bruins can decide, or Minnesota has been really good to us, the Minnesota Wild, in the team store. They can take in Minnesota Wild Operation Hattrick or just American Flag Operation Hattrick merchandise, and they can sell it in the team store without permission from the NHL. 
the NHL, but they can't sell. You can't sell in the NHL store on Fifth Avenue in New York. It's only in the team stores. Only in the team stores. Okay. Yep. Uh, and they have to have, well, no, they could decide who they want to buy from. So the Boston Bruins buy from a company called Coliseum that we're very, very active with. And they're not an NHL licensee yet. Uh, so, but the NFL and Major League Baseball tells you where you can purchase things and team shops are not one. Okay. So uh, it's a little different there. So, and I say 500 schools were really big in the college space where it started. Some do very little, some do nothing, and so, but they've still adopted Operation Hattrick. So it's our job to get them to place the order in the bookstore at retail, at retail, do a military appreciation day game. And so we've worked toward that. Are there certain dot, are there certain uh, wounded warrior organizations that you give to how do you do how do you go about that yeah we have a board and the board is pretty conservative and it's really interesting uh, nate hardy's dad is on the board and it was a genius thing to do because nobody is going to question if you had got the guy's father on the board we're not going to misspend one dollar not going to do it and we've got somebody from the naval academy who fought with nate in fallujah and uh, he's got a Marine buddy who just retired. He's doing some farming up in Maine. And then we've got a variety of other people, right, who have some experience in the kinds of things we do, college activations on campuses and things like that. And so the board, we have now have a formal process. We have overall given to 80 organizations. Last year alone, we gave to 40. We're relatively small. We want to stay small. I want to be able to call... Uh, Mac V in mm -hmm. Duluth, I want to be able to call the general and say, look, this is what I want to do. That's how I got to Duluth Pack. This is what I'd like to do. And um, if you were really big, you can't do that very well. We want to know the people we give money to. We have a really strict policy so people know we have an impact. We're here to stay and we make a difference and we do it right. So we have a request for funding process where people have to submit a proposal as to why they want money. We don't give anybody more than $25,000. We have one exception to that. That's the Travis Mills Foundation and Travis is a quadruple amputee. He's one of five who has survived quadruple amputation. And he has bought the Elizabeth Arden summer property in Rome, Maine. And he's done about a $4 million renovation for a retreat for recalibrated veterans and their families. The difference is Families get to go. So that little boy gets to see that his daddy who's missing three limbs is just like that little boy's daddy who's missing three limbs, right? Really important. They have 125 feet on the Belgrade Lakes and there is not a retreat better in the country. It's like Wayfair furnished it at no charge. It is like a five-star hotel. First time I went for a tour after it was done, I was like, I want that and I want that and I want that and I want that. I want all that stuff. Yeah. And we support one whole week. It's OHT week, depending on when it is in the summer. We pay for up to 40 people to come in and spend a week. And some of these guys have been so badly injured, they would never be able to go on vacation ever because of their injuries. Right. And so they get to do things, connect with people. They get to do things like go on a kayak and they don't swim and they're scared to death to do it. And at the end, they've done it and they're so proud of themselves. So, um, but other organizations don't get more than 25 uh, or 25 the first time around. We've made more money. So we're able to give more people money. And um, our two key words are wounded and recovering. So we support the re recovery of wounded service members and veterans. Could be visible wound, could be invisible, and more and more today is invisible. We've been to Walter Reed six times, a group of us. And um, I'll tell you two, two quick stories because you'll enjoy, especially the second one. Uh, you go in and we go in the workout room, 60 guys from one to four amputations. It is like, what am I seeing? If you cry, you go out in the hall. I had the Hardys with me and poor Donna Hardy she said, I don't know if I can do it. So I, I held her hand. She made it through the first one and then she was fine. But there's a young man there, 25 years old. He's got a five-year-old and, and a five-month-old and he's a triple amputee. He's been burned and he's got shrapnel. 
and he's depressed. You think? You think he's oh depressed? Oh boy, I have I have goosebumps. Now, we, we, we have hats that we're giving out. And somebody, I gave him a hat and he, he started to cry. And he said, ma'am, you've almost made me feel normal again today. And maybe, just maybe, my five-year-old won't be afraid of me when he comes in to visit. Makes a difference. Makes a difference. Were, yeah. I started to cry, so I had to go out in the hall. Then I was in group two. Group one had the university president, two U.S. senators, the Hardys, and a couple of other people. And they said, get in the gown, the mask, the gloves, the booties, the headpiece. Whoa, am I glad I'm not in that group. They go in a room, a young man had been, had a penetrating head wound. Didn't know if he'd survive and he certainly was having surgery. They thought he would lose both legs. They thought he had the flesh eating disease. And he told his father he was not going to wear the padded helmet you have to wear after brain surgery. So the father came out in tears and he said, he won't wear this helmet after surgery. The president looked at me and he said, Dot, got a hockey helmet? I said, yeah. He said, you get it to this guy. Kid had been a hockey player. So Van Riemsdyk, who plays for Philadelphia, yes. James, he was, going, he was going pro. And so we got his helmet. We had it signed. And I sent it back. And I don't know who this young man is, right? I have no clue. Uh, nine months later, I get a very nice note from a really pretty girl and a really good looking young man. She wrote it to say that uh, his name was Shane and that he had struggled and that they did 22 surgeries. He did not lose his legs. They cleared up his uh, flesh eating disease, but that the penetrating head wound left him so that he couldn't write it himself. They were getting married. So we sent them UNH sweatshirts as a wedding gift. And uh, she wanted us to know that the reason he had recovered to the point he had recovered was because he thought he played hockey at UNH. Wow. He wore the he wore the helmet every single day. I hope he's been in the press box since and, and he's become a, a ravenous fan of UNH. I don't, we don't know what, you know, you don't really communicate with them. Um, that we did a little bit. Uh, even the president said, you know, it, in my 30 years of being in collegiate administration, it's the most rewarding thing I have ever done in my life. And I always fly back home when I'm doing work and he said, I just had to sit there and think about what I just saw. Maybe more of us should see things like that, Dot. Maybe more of us should. Exactly. So you're doing yes. great things. And, and I want to I give you a little bit of a commercial here, and I need your help with it, because people who are listening, how can they contribute, first of all, money, but more importantly, what can they look for when, when we're in Minnesota here, we have a lot of listeners here, but anywhere at these arenas or these venues, what can they look for? Because they're going to buy a hat or a shirt anyway. Right. And they say, I might as well buy that shirt because then X percent of this is going back to a great, great foundation. What can they look for? So they make sure they buy yours. Yeah. Our website is operationhattrick.org. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and um, Instagram. We do a lot there. Um, we On our website, it says shop now. You can go there. We don't carry inventory, but you can click on like fanatics and things will come up. You can go to fanatics.com and starting tomorrow, tomorrow, we have a huge, huge program with them with 130 schools and UMD will probably be on that list and any other school they would like to have. And we have, you can imagine the Notre Dame has like 14 different designs because Notre Dame sells like crazy. Right. Um, if you go into the Minnesota wild, look for operation hat trick hats. I'm not sure what UMD might have uh, in their rank. Uh, I know uh, Jason, right? Isn't that the athletic? Yes, it there? is. Yes. Yes. Uh, I knew him when he was at Notre Dame. He's very, very proactive. And quite frankly, it was two UNH alums who are in uh, Duluth now. Now, one paid out of his own pocket and the other one works for your TV station. And she did a hat program and we involved Minnesota Duluth Bulldogs where the um, and on air, they would sell the hats. They didn't do it this year because of the pandemic. And that's when we reached out to Duluth Pack 
and we are running a program now with about 15 items that you can buy Operation Hattrick through Duluth Pack. And uh, we give all of our proceeds, we earmark all of our proceeds to the Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans, and we do it for Duluth only. <clears throat> so we have helped bring that home. The general tells me we've helped bring that homeless population down to four in Minnesota Duluth. Some want to be homeless, but otherwise that money has gone to helping get rid of homelessness. And we will, we're thrilled that we found Minnesota Duluth. Quite frankly, people think it's very important that we have products that are made in the USA. I love the fact that you're older than penicillin and white bread. I think that's absolutely terrific. I, I tell everybody that. Isn't that crazy? I have, <laughs> I have a couple of products and I take it everywhere and people go, where'd you get that? We have a couple of hunting items and we're hoping to get more into the outdoor. But thanks to UNH alums, we're in Duluth. Well, and we didn't mean that to be a commercial for Duluth Pack, but we are working with Operation Hattrick and are very proud to be working with you uh, and Operation Hattrick. We just want people to go and buy your merchandise because more and more money will get in the hands and, and we can have trusting people that'll get it in the right hands for people that are recovering, uh, military people recovering from severe injuries. So it's very important. And if you're gonna buy a hat or buy a jersey or buy uh, any item, just look for that tag that would have Operation Hattrick or ask because you're, gonna, you're going to buy something anyway. So you might as well buy something where some of the proceeds go directly to a great philanthropic uh, activity. And, and we appreciate that. So Dot, let's, switch gears a little bit because what you're doing is so great and others might be listening and say, how do I get into a career like that? What advice can you give to somebody from the standpoint of, of uh, getting into nonprofit, whether they're in school, what are some of the, maybe a major that they can take and then how can they stand out? I'm not sure if there are majors, maybe in sociology a, a lot, maybe going into social work. Listen, I've been lucky along the way. I mean, if you look at, <clears throat> we've got an accountant that does our work for nothing. We've got a licensing agency that does our, um, account, uh, uh, manages our program from a royalty standpoint for nothing. It's like, wow, how did you fall into that? That is absolutely fabulous. We have a very, very, very lean staff. I uh, have a young man, Trey, who works with us out of Atlanta and we are it him and me, and then we've got a lot of volunteers. We don't do programming on our own. We don't do um, fundraising on our own. Others do it for us. So in Northern New Hampshire this summer, there was a golf tournament and there's a golf course up there that has an Operation Hat Trick golf tournament and they give us the proceeds. Love it, absolutely love it. On anything somebody will buy, there should be a hang tag that tells you the story about Nate and Mike. And there's a picture of Nate and Mike with the Navy SEAL Trident logo. And that's particularly important. We got permission from the head Navy SEAL to do that at the time. And not everybody gets permission to use the Navy SEAL Trident logo. So um, that will tell you a little bit about the story. Some stores have signage. Some We try to get all the stores to have signage, but not all of them do. We're online. You have to be direct to consumer. Have to be. Uh, because, I mean, we're in some Shields, Academy, Kohl's, Dick Sporting Goods, uh, a number of mom and pops. And retail has suffered a quite a bit, quite frankly. So this Fanatics collection, I'll tell you that's starting up tomorrow. We just kept our fingers crossed that, is it, did it get delivered? Well, 90% of it has, some of it's still coming in, uh, but it will be, that has put us at a different level so that we are able to give more money to more organizations every year. And folks, she's saying it's starting tomorrow. By the time you listen to this, it will have been started. That's right. Yeah, so, that's true. By the time they listen to this, they may be out of a lot of things, but they continue to sell it uh, as long as product is there. And you know what? It's a great program. It's it's giving your money to a great place. So if you have to wait a little while to get it once you've ordered it, stop complaining because it's a great thing that's happening. Dot, give us your website. Give us your social handle so people can go and do a little research on Operation Hattrick. Yeah, so have them go to operationhattrick.org and on there it will tell you what our handles are. Perfect. Folks, operationhattrick.org. That's right. That means it's nonprofit, right? Yes. Now, in terms of telling people what to do to get into nonprofit, really, in this case, we're, we're running a business. 
We've built a brand business. We've built a brand. I underestimated how difficult it is to create a brand, <laughs> right? Now, this brand is, you know, some people don't know who it is, but it's recognized. It has value. It's interesting. So we're a partner with Sig Sauer. And there are a lot of people who say, oh, that's a weapons company. First of all, their headquarters are here in New Hampshire. So it makes sense. Secondly, look at our demographic. They hunt, they fish, they shoot. There's no doubt about it. You know, but we've got a lot of military who does that. And we are a part of their e-commerce site. We sell six hour Operation Hattrick Hats online. <clears throat> and their VP for sales said, do you know how difficult it is to do what you've done, Dodd? I said, yeah, I know I live it every day, <laughs> every day. But you know what, Tom, when you meet a young man who has a need and a problem, you know exactly why you're doing it. So today, folks, we're talking to Dot Sheehan of Operation Hattrick, which is a great, great organization. We've heard a lot about the organization. We've heard a lot about... Oh, boy. The role of leading Operation Hattrick. Okay. I don't know what is going on. Wow. Can you, can you, am I good? Mm-hmm. Are we all good again? I guess. I mean, okay. not to sound morbid, but that I would Folks, lose one of So my today children. we've been talking with Dot Sheehan of Operation Hattrick, and we ask you to please support Operation Hattrick. But before we go, we're going to dig a little deeper into the life of Dot. And we're go- oh, yes, we're going into what we call the packed questions segment. Real easy, Dot. Dot, what is your favorite movie of all times? Hmm. Boy, oh boy. Between the holiday and Shawshank Redemption. (laughs) I think that would be favorites of a lot of people. And the favorite place we will end with that you've ever visited. Oh, boy. Cut to Bermuda and the Hotel Dell in Coronado, California. So, folks, we cannot thank enough Dot Sheehan of Operation Hattrick. We implore everyone to go and look under operationhattrick.org and and, uh, contribute, buy their gear, because it gets to the right place. Dot, thank you so much for being here today. Folks, until next time, unplug from the indoors and recharge in the outdoors.